Okay. Hey guys, like the hair? Because if you don't, too fucking bad. Anyway, I just finished my summer school class, business and society. Now, I was expecting a non-biased approach to this topic. After all, textbooks are supposed to be objective. As a better for, to take an objective stance on the issue of discussion. I was so fucking mistaken. Apparently, textbooks are supposed to be biased in favor of the establishment. Because of that, I've had problems with this book since page one. And I'd like to share some of them with you. Now first, the book barrages you with the following message. The poor corporations are powerless against the evil people in the totalitarian U.S. government. I'm not kidding. This is the actual viewpoint this book is trying to make you believe. Business is presented as good, just, fair, and individualistic, and all that nice stuff. This fucking book actually tries to make you think that business should be doing whatever the fuck it wants to do, and the rest of the world should stop interfering with conventional business practices or society will fucking implode. Most of the chapters are a little hazy to me, but the one I remember most is chapter 11, and what an appropriate title since this book is almost completely bankrupt of anything very accurate. Regulation is the focus of this chapter, and there is one quote that I'd like to share with you. Beware, this is a pretty long quote. I know quotes are supposed to be fairly short, but I have to make it long if I want my reaction to it to seem reasonable. But that's neither here nor there. Anyway, as we attempt to understand why I'll, oh yeah, the book is on my computer, it's a downloadable version. As we attempt to understand why all this has happened, it is only natural to look to changes in the social and technological environments for some explanations. Since World War II, four major changes impacted the business-government relationship. First, a national society has arisen out of local and regional societies. Second, the rise of a communal society has led to a great emphasis on public goods and the internalization of external costs. Third, the revolution of rising expectations has increased the demand for entitlements. Good jobs, excellent housing, and other amenities. Fourth, a rising concern has emerged for an improved quality of life. The words quality of life are in quotations. This strikes me as odd, because if I wanted a better quality of life and I was writing about it, I wouldn't use fucking quotations. How dare we demand a better quality of life? We act as though we deserve to be treated well. Fuck you, authors of this book. You don't know shit about the human condition. Hurry up and die. Well, anyway, in an ideal world, the public controls the government. The book admits this. It also admits that we don't live in that ideal world. However, it offers no solution to this, which leads me to believe that this book knows what it is defending stands in the way of the realization of an ideal world. Third, in a few places in the book, government's relationship to business and society is explored. However, it goes about it the wrong way. It's correct in saying that government doesn't always act according to the will of the people. It is also correct in saying that government often regulates business and society. What it leaves out is that government's relationship with its subjects is rapidly deteriorating. The United States government has largely ignored the will of the people on major issues as of late. On the national budget, more than 51% of us want to cut the military. We're spending over a billion dollars a month on it. What does the government do instead? They say, well, the military is our nation's big waving dick. If we don't overspend on it, our dick won't be nearly as impressive. And when that happens, other nations will realize they can take us on. So, instead of cutting some of our dick off, let's take out the liver and heart, you know, our education and culture budgets. They want to complain? Let them. As long as they're paying their taxes, we don't care. On taxes, people want to tax, tax the rich. But because politicians can't get reelected without the help of the rich, they keep giving the rich more tax breaks. Our government sucks at being of the people, by the people, and for the people, and it's time we did something about it. By the way, when is the last time that people themselves have successfully removed an elected official from office? I don't remember. The scenario usually plays out like this nowadays. Jackass in office does something we don't want him to do, and we want his or her head on a stick. Now, here's where error comes into play. Instead of the people formerly or violently, if I prefer, well, I prefer that, removing them from office, the same government the asshole is a part of forms a committee to investigate the incident in order to decide if the person should be removed from office. 
At least that's what the public is led to believe. What the committee really does is weigh the pros and cons of removing that person from office. The questions they usually ask themselves are as follows. How much influence does this person have on the public, their party, and us? Is this influence positive or negative? Will their removal hurt us more than the public or vice versa? And can we replace them with a person we can control just as easily or even better, even easier? Our votes are meaningless. When we don't see a Democrat making changes that we want, we vote Republican. When the Republican fails to deliver as well, we switch parties again. None of our politicians are getting it right, and we need to follow the Declaration of Independence which has been downplayed as a simple letter to the King of England, and not applicable beyond that. The following is a quote from it. Really long, yet again. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government, that whenever, er, whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and, it and to institute new government. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, but when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object... I'm getting thirsty. <sighs> Great shit. Evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism. It is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Lovely quote, we don't follow it anymore because nobody thinks like that anymore. Here are some of the king's offenses, which I'll liken to modern America. He has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments, for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has constrained our fellow citizens, taken captive on the high seas, to bear arms against their country, to become executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. Now, I'll relate these offenses to our modern times. Our cops and our military are allowed to kill, injure, and restrict the freedoms of our fellow citizens. They can claim self-defense, or call you a terrorist, or some other criminal, and it's always your word against theirs. They can keep you locked up as long as your detention stays off the record. They can torture you if they declare you an enemy combatant or a threat to national security. As for the transportation of people across the sea for dubious reasons, look no further than Guantanamo Bay. If you want a few examples of the government taking away our most valued laws, look at our airport security and its adherence to the Fourth Amendment, or should I say adherent in adherence to the Fourth Amendment. Look at the existence of free speech zones. The First Amendment clearly states that the whole country is a free speech zone. Why protest that the people doing the protestable actions can't see or hear you? If you don't think the government is legislating every aspect of our lives, think again. Did you know that you have to pay for a marriage license aside from the actual declaration of marriage? If you don't get one, you are not legally married. Did you know that you have to get a permit if you even plan on adding to your house, even if the addition doesn't interfere with public property at all? If you don't, the government is granting the privilege of kicking you out of your house by nailing a big sign label condemned on your front door. What do you think we do to soldiers who even talk about disobeying orders? The least we do is extradite those poor bastards. If the government is in the mood, it will execute them on the spot. No trial, no investigation, and no regrets. Unfortunately for the ex-soldier, the government usually dishonorably discharges the codified murderer and strips him or her of, her of their rights to life, liberty, and the attainment of happiness. It allows them to pursue happiness, but never to obtain it. Alright, that's enough about government. I'm good and pissed now, and I'll tend to get a bit violent when I'm pissed off, so I'll stop the video here. See you later, fucktards.